Good morning, everybody. Let's stand and worship together.
his name. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, and Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my
shouting Jesus from the mountains, Jesus from the street, Jesus in every situation because that is the name that changes everything. And above that name, there is no other. There will never be any higher than that name of Jesus. We're going to switch the popping noise, so we'll just go ahead and switch over. Hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. When I was a boy, there were many days that I would call my, my papa. And I would call my papa and I'd say, hey, papa, can you come get me and take me hunting? And I, he knew exactly what I meant, that we were going squirrel hunting. And, and there was never a time that he denied that request. He always came and got me or somebody would take me to his house and we would go hunting. My papa had a very unique ability in that he could spot a squirrel a country mile away. And I remember time and time again being in the woods with him, and he would stop, and he would say, Boy, are you not going to shoot that squirrel? And I'd say, Papa, I don't see a squirrel. And he'd say, Look up in that tree right at that fork to the right. Do you not see that squirrel? And I'd say, No, sir, I don't see that squirrel. And he'd get down on his knees, and he'd point his, he said, Follow my finger, son, and look at my finger. Do you see that squirrel? And I'd say, No, sir. I don't see that squirrel. He said, well, if you're not going to shoot it, I am. And he'd blow the little sucker's brains out, and it'd fall out of the tree. And I'm like, well, there was a squirrel there after all. And I eventually picked up on what he was saying, that my papa could pick out a squirrel, and when he was looking at the fork of that tree, there might not be anything sticking up but one little point of one little ear. But my papa could see that. It was hidden in plain sight from me. Some of you can't relate to that because you've never been squirrel hunting with my papa, but maybe you can relate to this. How many of you lose things inside your house? On three, shout out what you lose most commonly inside your house. One, two, three. Car keys, Car keys glasses, remote, cell phone, charger, whatever it is. And we call everybody in the house or we call who's available. Hey, can you find my whatever it is that you just said, and if they're like me, when I go find it, I respond with this statement. It's right here, right where you left it. And it was hidden in plain sight. And for a lot of you in this house today, and a lot of you joining us online, Jesus is hidden in plain sight. He's not hidden from you, you just can't see him because you're not looking for him. And you don't know how to speak the name of Jesus into every situation because you've never come into that moment where you would speak the name of Jesus into every situation. You see, because we, we do this. We say, hey, you know what? We, we confuse the presence of God in our life with the absence of problems and the goodness of God in our life with the absence of problems. And I think there's been a, a whole theological line based on those two things. Uh, I call them the feel-good boys of the TV stations, that they would base a theological statement on, hey, if everything's not hunky-dory in your life, then you must be doing something wrong. No, that's not what the Bible would state. We find ourselves in 2 Kings chapter 6 today. 2 Kings chapter 6. And here's what it says. It says, And the king of Aram was at war. And you need to understand something, that the day you cross the line and you ask Jesus Christ into your heart and life, you enter into a war. You enter into a war all the rest of the days of your life on planet Earth. And the Bible would refer to it as spiritual war, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities and the wicked things of the dark world. And so we are in a war in a real sense. And in this very moment, in this room, there is a spiritual war going on. And the reality, for some of you in this house today, the spiritual war is over your very eternity of whether you'll, whether you'll spend eternity in heaven or you'll spend eternity in hell. And there is a warring going on over the lives of humanity in this moment. It says, they were at war with Israel, and after conferring with the officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. And the man sent word to the king of Israel. And what's that next word? Beware. Be where of passing that place because the Armenians are going down 
there. And what we've got to understand is that word is oftentimes in the Bible of beware or, or take heed or take note or really understand or take, take into effect or really search this thing out. And so when beware is in there, you need to understand that there is a difference between the warning of God and the threat of the enemy. See, God's warning are always rooted in truth. Enemies' threats are always based on a lie. So what you've got to do is when there is a warning in your life, when there is something in your life that says, hey, you might ought to enter into this situation with caution. You might ought to be careful of going there. You might ought to not speak that word in the moment. You might ought to not return that email in the moment. When there is that warning from God, and you've got to see, does this thing line up with Scripture? Or is it the enemy trying to sneak a lie on, in on me? And you say, well, what's that mean? That means you need to learn to read your Bible. And not only do you need to learn to read your Bible and understand your Bible, you need to marinate your life in the Word of God. And you need to hide it in your heart as the psalmist told us. But very few people do that. We don't memorize Scripture like we used to. And I, I want you to, we're not going to, well, I, well we, we'll see. I want you to think about this. If you've been a Christian in the house for 10 years or longer, for 10 years or longer, and you say, you know what? I could quote three verses for every year that I've been a born-again Christian, and I could give you the reference point, I give you the address, and say the verse. Would you just lift up your hand? Anybody in the house say, yeah, I could do that? Anybody in the house? Nobody in the house could do that. Now let me do this. How many of you have been Christians for more than 10 years? And not a one of you can tell me one, three verses for every one year that you've been a Christian. And you wonder why you get your teeth kicked in by the enemy every single day. Think about this. Here's what the Bible says. It says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not what against you? Sin. So you do kind of know the scripture. And it says that your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so we, need, we begin to marinate that in our life and marinate that over our life. You see, God's warning revolve around what will happen. The enemy's threats revolve around what might happen. God says this. God says, hey, if you don't listen and you don't obey the truth that I put before you, and you don't have some spiritual principles about your life that I've laid out for you in my book, that there will be some consequences of your life, that you'll, you'll come under some consequences. What the, the threat of the enemy would be this. It would be, well, if, if you do, then this. If you do, then this. God says, no. He says, if you want to walk away from me, I love you enough that I'll let you walk away from me. But if you do, there will be some consequences. And the book of Hebrews would tell us this, that there is not a child that is loved that God does not discipline. Meaning this, if you can walk away from the principal reality truth of Scripture, if you can walk away from foundational faith, and there is no chastisement, there is no discipline in your life, I would suggest that you really need to check sonship or daughtership. You say, well, that's being judgmental. No, that's being a fruit inspector. Because many who say they walk away from the faith and they never come under any consequences and they just live life hunky-dory and there's never consequences to their, and there's never a chastisement in their life, I would dare say that sonship or daughtership does not exist. That they have played a game somewhere along the line. God's warnings always mobilize us. The enemy's threat would paralyze us. God's warnings push us in the right direction. The enemy's threats put a foot on our back and they keep us down. God's warnings always instruct specifically to us. They're speci specified things. The enemy threats are always condemnation and vague. The enemy always speaks vaguely and he always speaks condemnation to us. The, the enemy would tell you this, that you're not worthy that you're not cared for, that you're actually not loved. God said this. He said, I emphatically say I love you when I died on the cross in your place. I put an explanation point at the end of my love for you that I emphatically love humanity. So he says, beware. Don't go to that place because the Armenians are going down there. And then verse 10. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on guard in such places. And this enraged the king of Aram. And he summoned the officers and demanded of them, tell me, which one of us is on the side 
of the king of Israel. Which one of us is on the side? He said, beware, if you go there, there's a trap. And what you need to understand about the adversary of the cross, which is also the adversary of the believer, is he specializes in setting traps. Think about all the things that went south in your life this week and maybe even this morning that tried to keep you out of the house of God today, but somehow you managed to make it in here by the Spirit of the living God. That he would set a trap, that he would set a stumbling block, that he would do something to hold you back. That he wants to wreak havoc in the life of every single believer. And so it enraged the king. Like no matter what I do, God's got somebody. There's somebody who is given the secret away. There is somebody who is giving our plans away. Verse 12. None of us, my Lord, the king said, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel. And he tells the king of Israel... The very words you speak in your bedroom. Elisha had become a problem for the enemy. And I just wonder how many believers are problems for the enemy. Elisha became a problem because he was giving away the secret places. He was telling what was going to happen. He was a prophet, so he was foretelling where they were going to be. And I just wondered, are you a problem for the darkness because of the light that you shine? I just wonder, for the, for the life of the believer, I wonder when your eyes pop open in the morning, if the devil says, oh dear God, she's awake again. Or oh dear Lord, he's awake again. I just wonder that of every believer. If we make that much difference on planet earth. And we need to learn to see some things. And he says, he speaks the very words that you speak in your bedroom. And we need to learn to see some things, not with our physical eyes, but with our spiritual eyes. And it's important for you to recognize the area or the areas of life where the enemy is attacking you. And ask God to give you insight to the areas of where you're most vulnerable. Think about it this way. Some of the fights that you enter into right now are fights that you were entering into two and three and four years ago. And there, you enter into those fights and those battles because you're in places you ought not be in the first place. You allow your eyes to wander, you allow your mind to wander, you allow your feet to wander, and you get in those places, and you need to stay away from those places. But here's what we do. We say this, well, I asked God to protect me before I went. No, you're going to a place and asking God to protect you from something that you know that you're going to willfully do. The reality is this, you can't play around with the devil and ask God to deliver you from the devil that you're playing around with. You just can't do it. And you have to be careful. Why? Because you can't afford to go to those places. Your, 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 your mind can't afford it. Your emotions can't afford it. Your joy can't afford it. And your peace can't afford it. Like maybe God's trying to warn you, hey, don't go there. Don't look at that. Why? Because when you go there and you look at that, you, you, you end up with the comparison issues. The comparison issues of, well, they, they have more or they do more or whatever it is. And you feel like a failure in your own right when you're not. But you have a comparison issue in that moment like you're missing something. And you get to that place where it's vulnerable. And he says this. He says, he, he, he speaks the very words that you speak in your bedroom. Meaning, he tells what goes on in the secret places. He tells what goes on that nobody else knows what goes on. He is telling, like there is an inside connection. How many of you have a show of hands? You go, you know what? I'd like to have an inside connection on some things. You'd like to have an inside connection on some things? Think about this. Wouldn't it be awesome if you had an inside connection on things? I mean, that would be a great tool to have. It would be a, a great thing for you to have and to wrap your head around. Would, think about it this way. Wouldn't it have been awesome that when Jesus died on the cross, went to the tomb, on the third day when he arose from the tomb, and then after 40 days he, he ascended to the Father, wouldn't it have been awesome if he had sent somebody 
to indwell the life of believers. Wait, that happened, didn't it, Mike? Called the Holy Spirit. You do have an inside connection. The Holy Spirit of God indwells the heart and life of every believer. And if you will lean into the Holy Spirit of God, you will begin to speak the name of Jesus. You will get into the Word of God. You will let it marinate your life. You will begin to memorize the Word of God. It will be more than information. It will bring life transformation. You see, in the Old Testament, God used prophets to speak to kings. He used prophets, which were the mouthpieces of God, mouthpieces of God on planet Earth in the day. Today, God uses the Holy Spirit again. The same Holy Spirit that indwells every pastor that you know, so don't put them on some kind of pedestal, is the same Holy Spirit that indwells the life of every born-again believer who will guide you in truth, guide you in righteousness, who will speak to you. And God will show you through the Holy Spirit, through His Word, where you need to be on your guard if you will just give Him the opportunity to. In verse 13, He says, go, go find out where He is. And the king ordered, so I can send men to capture Him. Which, that's funny. I mean, if He shows the places to Him that the king is speaking in His bedroom, I mean, Elisha's going to know to hide that, that they're coming and he says, go, go get him. He says, he's in Dothan. He said, then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. And they went by night and they surrounded the city. They surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, no, my Lord. I believe that's one of the most common prayers prayed. Oh, dear God. Oh, my God. Help. Oh, dear Lord. Show up. Oh, dear Lord. Do something. It's the desperation prayer of the believer. What shall we do? Like the servant wakes up and the world that he went to sleep in is not the world that he woke up in because he has been surrounded by the enemy in that moment. He saw something when he awoke that he had no idea how to handle. Have you ever had that in your life? Have you ever had the oh my God moment? Oh my Lord, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. Oh my Lord, this is coming against me. This is stacked against me. I don't know what I'm going to do in this moment. And that's what the servant has in this moment. And most of the time, when it's the oh my Lord moment, there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of stress, and there's a lot of confrontation in the moment. In Elisha, verse 16, don't be afraid. The prophet answered, those who are with us are more than those who are with us them and he not only means in quantity but he also means in greater strength maybe i can illustrate this visually for you um come here miles come here uh you two guys come here stand right there you two guys come here Stand on this side of my house. You too. No. Yeah, or just, yeah, that's good. Come on. Come on. Come on up. Just kind of stand here. Come on up, Jackson. Right there. Okay, so think about this. The servant wakes up and he sees the enemies. Oh, dear God, overnight we have been surrounded. But I want you, I want to give you a greater picture of what, what, what's really going on here. Where he, he said this. He said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Melix, come here. Come on. Michael Hill, come here. Cannon a lot, come here. Gator, come here. Come all the way up on stage. Get right in front of those guys facing me. Yeah. 
Wait. It gets better. Joe, come here. Dean, come here. Philip, come here. You, down there, on, uh, no, on the bottom. Starkey, come here. You gonna put your money on the students, or you gonna put your money on the beef? <laughs> Stay here for just a second. And here's what he says. He says, those who are surrounding us are more than those who surround you. I had always pictured this of there was one surrounding. The enemy had surrounded the camp. The servant can't see it. He's looking with physical eyes. Elisha said, open his eyes so he can see the more. That means not only greater quantity, but greater strength. There's greater quantity. There's greater strength that has surrounded. And not only are the enemy, yeah, the enemy surrounded me, but I got those who are between me and the enemy, and I got those who are behind the enemy. The warring angels. Thank you, guys. You can go be seated. Thank you so much. The warring angels. It means rank upon rank of warring angels. You're going, wait a minute now, Shane. The angels that I have seen were chubby little guys with, with diapers and a halo and wings that had harps. They go, bling, and that's, that's not it. Okay? Now, we know there's three or four types or kinds of angels in heaven. There are the seraphim and the cherubim. Do you know what their assignment is in this moment? Anybody? Anybody raise your hand and say, I know what their assignment is? I'm going to teach you something. You don't read your Bibles. One person reads their Bible. The cherubim and the seraphim. In this moment and throughout eternity, through eternity past, eternity present, and throughout all of eternity, their assignment is in this moment, they are circling the throne of God and they're saying three words. What are they? Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Why three? Because one's not good enough. He's that holy. That's the only answer I got for that. We know there are guardian angels. There's a guardian angel at the gate of heaven. Anybody know his name? Look it up. But there are guardian angels. We hear about guardian angels even here on earth. If there are demons assigned to you, you got to understand, believer, there are angels assigned to you. Hello? That ought to make somebody just a little bit happy in the house. That there are angels who watch over. And then the Bible says there are warring angels. There are warring angels. Who, do you know who the chief warring angel is? His name starts with an M and has Eichel in it. Oh, great. You do read your Bible. Michael is a chief warring angel. And so here's what it is. And this one blew my mind when I was doing a little study on angels this week after I'd had a conversation with somebody from our church. And they, they brought up angels. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go home and, and just get on a tangent and just look at angels here. Here's what it is. Isaiah 37, verse 36. So if your picture of an angel is a little fat chubby dude with a diaper, a halo, some wings, or a little arrow who's going to start shooting them about the 13th of next month, 14th of next month, that ain't it. Here's what it says about those warring angels. That, that we would go, yeah, I may be surrounded, but I'm more surrounded by you. And my enemies are more surrounded by you. So there is a, a two, a warring angel. And here's how bad those dudes are. I have, I, I looked it up on my little Bible app that I read every single day. For the last eight years, I know for sure and certain because my Bible app traps it. For the last eight years, I have read my Bible all the way through. That's not anything big. That's like, oh, he's so spiritual. No, that's just what I do. That's what every believer ought to do. I know for sure and certain, Mike, that I have read my Bible every year for the last eight years. I have never seen this verse until just the other day. Isaiah 37, verse 36. I'm not going to quote the verse. I'm going to tell you what the verse says. You can look it up later. It tells us this about the warring angels of God. It says that one angel, one angel put 186 
thousand men to death in a Syrian army camp one night. How many of you go, that's the one I want surrounding me? Open the eyes. Open his eyes so he can see. Open his eyes so he can see. And he opened and he saw. He saw. When the eyes of my heart are opened, I begin to move in faith. He wasn't talking about opening his physical eyes. His physical eyes were open the moment that he woke up from his sleep and slumber. He woke up with his natural eyes, and all he could see were the enemies that had surrounded him in the moment. But he needed a deeper spiritual insight. And he says, open his eyes, verse 17, so he may see. The Lord opened his eyes, and he looked and he saw the hills full of horses and chariots, a fire all around Elisha. His perspective changed when his spiritual eyes opened, when he opened the eyes of his heart, like a pair of binoculars. A pair of binoculars are made so that you can look far off and it brings it right up in your face, right? And so many people spend their life looking at enemies that are so far off, but you're looking through them through binoculars and you feel like they're coming against you. What you need to learn to do is flip your binoculars the other way, look through the big, big end, and then look out the little end. And all of a sudden, that stuff that seemed real close is actually really, really distance away from you. It gives you a different perspective. And you'll see that God has sent the salvation. You'll see that God has sent the protection. You'll see that there are warring angels surrounding you in the moment. You know one of the greatest things that flips that lens in your life? is worship. Worship. That's why you hear me tell you all the time. Worship is not what you do in this house. Worship should be a lifestyle. It's something that you should do every single day of your life. That You should worship. That you should get in that moment. Why? Because if you do that, what happens in this house is only the overflow of what happened in your life all week long. Verse 18. He saw the chariots of fire. His eyes had been opened. Saw that there were more surrounding, and then more surrounding, and then more surrounding. And then verse 18 happened. As the enemy came down toward him. This guy just had his spiritual eyes open. And all of a sudden the enemy comes. Don't you ever think for one minute that the presence of God is the absence of problems. The proof of the presence of God is not that problems disappear. The proof of the presence of God is that He kept you surrounded. He kept you surrounded. Psalms 34, verse 7. The angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Psalms 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge, He is my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare. He will pluck you out of that. He will snatch your feet out of that. He will cover you with feathers. And under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but you 
will not come near. You will only observe with the eyes and see punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most, the most high your dwelling, no harm, no harm, no harm. Everybody say no harm. No harm will overtake you. No disaster will near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of his ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he who loves me says to the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for acknowledgement of my name. He will call on me. He will call on me. And then what's it say? I will. What's it? I will what? I will what? Understand it does not say that I will be silent. It does not say that he will ignore his kids. He says, I will answer him. And I will be with him in trouble. Wait, I thought the presence of God was the absence of trouble. Nope. He'll be with you in trouble. He'll be with you in trouble. And I will deliver him and honor him with a long life, and I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. I know there are times it looks like you're alone. I get there are times it feels like you're alone. I understand there are times that you're going it doesn't make sense. God has somehow walked away. He's somehow ignoring me in the moment. But look again. Look again. Heaven is full of resources. Heaven's army are gathered. And they have surrounded. They have surrounded your surrounders, church. It may look like you're surrounded but heaven's army surrounding you let's pray together father thank you for your love god your incredible mercy and your incredible grace over our life and father first there may be those here father those who are watching online in this moment who have never said yes to you they've never had that moment where they've invited you in to be their lord and their savior They've never had that moment of a spiritual awakening. They've never had that moment of having their spiritual eyes opened. But today was the day that you appointed. Father, today was the day that you ordained for them to come into saving knowledge of you. And that's you, and today would be the day that you say, you know what, Shane, I need a relationship. Or maybe you're going, I don't understand why a relationship is so important, Shane. Well, the Bible expressly teaches about an eternity that will be faced by every man, woman, boy, and girl. And it says there's two options to eternity. For those who know and have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, their eternity will be spent in that place known as heaven. For those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and do not have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, their eternity will be spent in a place called hell. You go, well, Shane, I don't, I don't believe in hell, and I don't believe in the devil, and I don't believe in demons. Just because you doesn't believe, just because you don't believe it, it doesn't make it not real. And so today would be an opportunity for you to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way. If that's you, I just invite you to pray a prayer with him. Say, hey, I need to know Jesus, Shane. Just invite you to pray a prayer. Say something like this. Say it from your heart straight, straight, straight to heaven in this moment. Say, Lord Jesus, right now, I admit before you that I'm a sinner. And I need a Savior. And today, God, I thank you for paying my sin debt on Calvary's cross. And today, God, I open up my heart. I open up my life. And I invite you in to be my Lord and to be my Savior. And I thank you, God, 
for forgiving me of my sins, for saving me of my sins, for giving me a home in heaven. If you prayed that prayer in just a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to begin to worship. We just invite you to come to one of us here at the front and say, hey, I prayed that prayer. We're not embarrassing you. We're not calling your name publicly. We're just going to pray for you. If you're watching online and you prayed that prayer, just text the word alive. Just put that in the comments. We'll be sure to respond to you later today. Maybe there's other prayer needs and prayer concerns in the house. It's always a joy. It's always a privilege to pray with you and for you. The altar is always open. The only thing that we ask, if you made that decision to become a Christ follower today, or if you need to come for prayer, that you do not wait. As we stand to our feet right now, you come.
standing right over here to my right love to give you a gift on behalf of the church as always you can give online text to give drop in a wall slot drop at the connect desk we hope that you have a blessed and wonderful safe sunday afternoon look forward to seeing you next sunday everybody